Our text for today is taken from the book of Romans, the third chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. <clears throat> Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The key words in our text for today, in the, that started the Reformation, are the words God's righteousness and his righteousness. And for a time in the church, it was taught that God's righteousness is what God expects of us. <clears throat> that we need to be perfect. To make amends with God. And that's something that has come up over and over and over again. In the New Testament, it's Phariseeism, isn't it? That we can please God. That will bring about God's heaven on earth. If we're good enough to earn God's favor. Well, guess what never happened? There was no hope in that teaching. In the Middle Ages, it took a different form. Give money to the church, buy your way into heaven. Punish yourself. Earn your way to heaven. In today's world, among some Christians, it still is a law. And it's taken different forms throughout the years. Earn your faith to get into heaven. Decide on God to earn your way. Really believe enough and anything can happen. But it's all taking God's word and saying, I can earn it myself. <clears throat> when Luther started teaching, when he was assigned to teach God's word, that's when God's word opened up to him and he discovered the truth of our text. What does our text say? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There isn't one of us. The only person who ever lived on earth who could accomplish God's law perfectly was Christ. The rest of us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it emphasizes this as it speaks to us. If you are under the law, you are subject to it. Well, who of us isn't under the law? In fact, in catechism class, one of the things that we teach is that Jesus had to be under the law, had to become one of us in order to fulfill the law. And as we deal with that second article, we see that if, if you teach that Jesus is only God or if you stress that Jesus is only man, salvation doesn't work anymore. Because if he's only one or the other, 
not both. He couldn't have been our savior. He had to be under the law. He had to die. Those are the reasons why he had to be man. But he also had to be not born with sin, conceived by the Holy Ghost, true God, to be perfect. And then the other part of it is that the sacrifice had to be so great that if he were only a man, he could only pay for one other person. But if he was God, Scripture goes so far as to say he pays double for all our sins. We could sin all the more, double of what we've done in our lives, and it would still be paid. <clears throat> because the price was so high, so precious. Scripture also says, if you sin at just one point, you are guilty of the law, guilty of sin before God. <clears throat> and again, there's not one of us that can say, well, I only sinned once. I had a math professor in high school that used to joke around with us. Well, I thought I was wrong once, but I was only mistaken. Not likely. Our text goes on to say, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. So if you think you can get into heaven just because you're a good person or you've tried to be good, guess what? You're sunk. It's like rowing in a boat that's got a hole in it. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Yeah, not right. You're sunk. And so what good is the law? Is God's law the problem? That he's too cruel? And no, the law still serves a purpose. By the law is the knowledge of sin. The law still serves a very important person for purpose. That we understand that we are sinners. And that we can't do it on our own. It's not possible. <clears> then <throat> I love what it says in our text. That every mouth must be stopped. Or maybe stopped. You ever run into one of those kids or one of those people that thinks that they can talk their way out of everything? This text is just for them and for all the rest of us too, but specifically for them. Oh, I think I can talk my way out of a speeding ticket or I can talk my way out of this or that. In my first congregation, I had a lot of little ones. <clears throat> and that grew as we grew as a congregation. And I had a young boy. He was very talented, but it also came at a price. He had some social anxiety. Very brilliant kid. But too smart sometimes for his own good. So we had a sleepover one night at church where we had the kids in tents outside. And I told, I sent the little kids to bed and I told the older kids, you can stay up for a little while longer, but if you go and scare the little kids on your way out to the tents, this is the last time I can trust you and there'll be some punishments for you. Well, guess what? This little kid thought he knew better than I did. <clears throat> and so guess what he did on the way out to the tent? He tried to scare his little brother and some of the little kids who had already gone to bed. And I called him in and I said, what are you doing? I told you not to do this. He said, well, I didn't scare them. I only startled them. He didn't like my reaction to that for some reason. 
Don't be stupid. There's a lot of people that might say, well, I'm a good person. <clears throat> Just as good or better than all kinds of other people. And they can point to all kinds of people that they look down upon. And this text says, you know what, that's fine, but guess what? You're not the judge. You're not the one that makes the rules. God is. And you can come across all kinds of people, and even we fall, you know, all of us fall into that category sometimes in our lives. Well, I can justify in my own mind the sins that I've committed. Or that jerk cut me off on the highway, so I have a right to be angry and curse and swear at him. And we justify it in our own minds. And again, the text says, guess what? You're not the judge. You don't get to make the rules. In fact, if we had one sin that we had to point out in this, in misinterpreting God's word. It's the sin against the first commandment. It's the sin of playing God, isn't it? Well, I want to make the decisions. I want to be the one in charge. That's so ingrained in us, isn't it? whether it's politics, whether it's work, whether it's school. Well, if I were in charge, and oh, God forbid sports, if I would have been the coach, this is what I would have done. One of my favorite commercials was, believe it or not, a Brett Favre commercial years ago where he was going to the store with his wife and the bagger didn't double bag the groceries and they spilled out all over the floor and he was playing Monday morning quarterback with everybody else just like they did with him. I would have double bagged it. I would have done this. And basically it's a situation of him seeing three problems or three messes and he plays Monday morning quarterback against everybody who's always done it to him. I just... I love the irony in that. That hits me for some reason. As Luther started to teach God's word, especially the epistles of Paul, he saw that God was speaking in a different way than his own church was speaking. That the righteousness of God was not the righteousness that God demanded. But the righteousness which God gives. And again, we see that some teach that people, some teach that the righteousness of God is the righteousness that God demands. It's interesting. I've actually gone to Salt Lake City. We had a pastor's conference there when I was a pastor on the West Coast. And Pastor Salstrom, when he was there, he got us into speak with one of the Mormon apostles. And this is a crazy situation. I, I didn't know till I got there how much these men are worshipped as living apostles, almost as much as they worship God. And I was disgusted by it. But we went in through a parking ramp. We had to have special passes, which were procured ahead of time. We went through the metal detector past the armed guards, and then we were finally allowed to speak with the apostle and one of the 72 up in the council chambers. And he said, well, 
you guys teach a cheap grace. See, that religion, as many other religions, holds on to, you have to do it yourself. You have to earn your way. And I'll never forget Pastor Openberger, our vice president of the Senate, said, well, can you at least admit that ours sounds better than yours does? Kind of in a smart aleck response to him. But I'll put it this way. We went to one of their bookstores afterwards and Pastor Salstrom had encouraged us to all wear our clerical collars to that meeting. And we were still in our clerical collars and the three ladies behind the counter had been taught to be terrified of the clerical collar by their church body. And Pastor Salstrom, knowing this, having lived in Salt Lake City, that's why he encouraged us to wear our clerical collar so that we would see the reaction against us. And I don't know if she drew the small straw or what, but one of them finally had the guts to come out and talk to me and say, what are you doing here? Why are you in our Mormon bookstore? And I said, well, we're trying to get information on your church and your church's teachings. We just met with Apostle Ballard. And when they heard that we had met with Apostle Ballard, it was almost like they wanted to touch us to get the radiance from the apostle that we apparently had. All of a sudden, we weren't scary anymore. We were blessed or holy or whatever. And it just gave me the heebie-jeebies, if you know what I mean. The Catholic Church was teaching that the righteousness of God is a righteousness God demands. And this tormented Luther. He could never feel close to God because he never felt like he was worthy enough. While he was a monk, he would often torture himself. They would find him passed out in the morning after he missed opening chapel services for the day because he had beaten himself so badly during the night. There was no way, according to the religion taught, that he could find himself right with God. But again, when he started teaching the Bible, what does God actually say? His eyes were opened. <clears throat> and that is this, the righteousness of God is not a righteousness that he demands, but a righteousness that he provides. What in our text demands this understanding of it. It is apart from the law. It's not something you can do on your own. It's not something that you have to accomplish. It's through faith in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. That's a word that appears a couple times in the New Testament, and it's not a word that we're a common, a common word among us but it means the substitute sacrifice. And it goes back to the Old Testament idea of the sacrifice of the lamb, <clears throat> that a lamb would come whose blood would protect us from the angel of death, from God's wrath. So is it any wonder that John the Baptist points at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our text continues. There is no boasting. Then how does a man get justified? A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Because it was impossible by the law to get to God, God created a different way, a gospel message. And Jesus himself says what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. And the glorious part of the Reformation that we still celebrate is that we are justified freely by his grace, as the text says. That this is a gift of God to us. Another section of scripture that's obviously important in this is Ephesians 2. For you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There's no way that a dead person can do anything to revive himself or herself. But it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. And so because scripture was so far different from what the church was teaching at the time, Luther said, well, wait a minute. This is what God says. And if it disagrees with what we're saying, we need to examine what we're saying. Because it's not of God. <clears throat> and I would imagine that you know the rest of the story. They kicked him out. They made him an outcast. And yet the word of God grew and bloomed and spread across the world. just as God had foretold it would. Way back at the time of Noah, when Noah spoke the words to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the promise that Shem would receive the Savior, but then Japheth would carry the message of the Savior. Savior for all people, not just the descendants of Shem or Japheth, but the descendants of everyone. Why do we celebrate the Reformation? We celebrate it because it's the situation in our spiritual lives where God is not a demanding God, an unloving Father, a Father who gives us so many things to do that we can't accomplish them. <clears throat> there are some times in my life when I felt like my dad was that kind of a father. Especially on Sunday morning as we were getting ready for church. Dad would give us a list of 10 things and said, move it! I would say, wait a minute, which five do you want done first? Because I only have two hands, Dad. And I never had the guts to actually say that out loud until I was ready to leave the house. And it doesn't matter because it was interesting as many times as we were given 10 things to do, we got those done and we still were in the car before my dad was. Ready to go to church. And parents get like that. Sometimes they get frustrated. They get angry that you've maybe let things go. And probably rightly so. But God is not that kind of God. He's a God of mercy. A God of love. Who did not spare his own son but sent him as a propitiation for our sins, a substitute sacrifice, that we are not held accountable for those sins. His son was already punished for those sins. That in Christ Jesus, we are free. Not free to sin, but free to rejoice in that we have a loving Father, a home, something that no one can take away from us, a loving and merciful Lord. Amen. <clears throat> now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting.
Amen.